Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Edward and Emiko for the very kind introduction, as well as the opportunity to present my work here at this conference. I'm really honored. Um, so I'm Yong Z Tan, and today I'm presenting this Back It Up vitrification device for CryEM that utilizes true grid wicking uh, technique to be able to produce CryEM grids of very co high consistency and of thin ice and allows for high resolution CryEM. So this was work done together with my PI John Rubenstein here at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. So taking a step back, um, for those of you in the audience who might not be so familiar with CryEM sample preparation, um, in CryEM we actually vitrify our samples on grids, which you can see here. Uh, it's made of gold or copper, uh, more conventionally, and then the sample is applied as a droplet onto these grids. So the, the pipette comes in and two to three microliters of the sample is applied. And if you look at this grids uh, in the picture, you can see that there's a large droplet of liquid. And if you actually freeze the whole droplet as is, the problem is that the ice is become, will be too thick and electrons cannot penetrate them. So in an electron microscope, you don't see anything. So what we have to do is actually to thin down this layer of liquid so that we get a, get a very thin ice of maybe 10 to 100 nanometers and we, when you freeze them. And this is conventionally done using filter paper. So we actually push a filter paper against the grid and this process called blotting actually occurs and the excess liquid is kind of wicked away and you're left with a very, very thin film of liquid um, present between the holes of the in, inside the grid. And this is, takes around 0.5 seconds to minutes. And once that is done, you pull away the filter paper, you plunge the whole grid into liquid, um, in a kind of liquid cryogen and freeze it. And then your grid is now ready to go be imaged in the microscope. So many conventional sample preparation devices are being used currently. So these are the more popular ones, such as um, Vitrobot, like our GP and Gatan CP3. So all these are good workhorses that utilizes the blotting technology and has been used for many, many cryem papers and many, many labs around the world. So they, are, they work really well, produce consistent grids. Um, one of the issues that they, they have is that it is quite wasteful. So all these devices require blotting, as I mentioned earlier, which you slap a piece of filter paper and wick away a lot of the sample. And actually 99.998% of the samples is wicked away by this technology. So you actually lose a lot of protein. Second of all, um, these devices are not cheap. They cost like tens of thousands of dollars. So what um, um, John, my PI, had the idea of doing is that, is it possible to design a cheap alternative to all these commercial devices using easily uh, available materials from, for example, Amazon. And so actually it is possible. So this on the right here is kind of a homemade vitrification device that John built, which he named Shake It Off. And it's a very simple device. And it, first of all, actually make use of self-wicking grids. Uh, grids that actually have the capacity to wick away liquids by themselves without the need for filter paper, uh, which was pioneered by Bridget Carragher and Clint Potter's lab. Uh, it can be found in Spoiler and Chameleon. So making use of these grids, you can actually not need to wick. And because you are, you, you're not wicking, you are, therefore have to apply less sample than what you conventionally do. And that's actually done using an ultrasonic humidifier. So this kind of PESO device is what you find on your normal humidifiers when it actually converts the water into like a little mist uh, that will humidify your air. And this is was why he was used to actually transfer the protein on the grid very cheaply. And this was uh, all controlled by a Raspberry Pi computer and the whole design is open source. Um, so kind of going back to the self cooking grid. So the idea for a conventional grid, which I presented earlier is that you have a filter paper, you uh, press it against the excess liquid and it kind of blots it away. And when you retract or plunge, um, you're left with a very thin film of liquid. For the self wicking grids, what actually happens is that you can actually grow nanowires on the grid bars themselves, such that the grid has a innate capacity to absorb some liquid. So when you apply your sample onto the grid, this liquid is now sucked away by these nanowires and you get a very thin film. And that is the, um, the theory that is used um, in, in right here in the, in the Shake It Off and Pioneer by in the um, Spot It On as well as Chameleon. So what better way to kind of understand the, the shake it off device than, um, than the actual video itself. 
So here you see this is the kind of the peso that we have and the and your sample is actually applied on as a droplet in the back of it. So that when you spray and electrify the peso, the liquid now spread out as a mist, then you can, you can apply very, very little amount of sample on the grid itself. So here is the device. You have your cryogen in the styrofoam box over here, and here you can see that's a, a solenoid for plunging. There's a safety in the lock for safety. And here is the is the peso itself, which actually sprays the, the, the mist of your sample. And you can attach the tweezers or grid onto it first, and then apply your sample onto the back of the peso. When the peso is electrified, the sample gets sprayed out onto the grid, and then at the same time, the solenoid is switched on, so it plunges the grid after it, sample application into the liquid cryogen mixture. Now you can move your grid into your grid box, whatever, and then you can image it on a microscope. So that is done. So for this first generation check it out device, um, you can get grids like these, and then you are able to from these grids find good eyes that produce um, you can see good samples that produce a 2.6 angstrom apoprotein reconstruction. So the formation of the mist from the peso itself is not bad for the protein. You're able to actually produce a uh, good reconstruction from it. So that's good to know. However, this first generation shake it off device does have its drawbacks. Um, so as you can see a conventional atlas from this grid, you have a thick ice in the middle and then no ice around at the side. And a usable ice is only this little fringe ring region around the thick ice. So that's very, very small uh, uh, area of usable ice, which is not good. Um, this is likely because of the way that we apply the sample using the peso. So the droplets in the mist are small, but they are not as small and finely controlled as the spotted on chameleon droplets, which are uh, emitted through a kind of inject printing technology. Therefore, the droplets can, there's still kind of a Gaussian distribution and the droplets actually saturate the nanowires capacity to actually absorb the liquid. Therefore, you still get thick ice over here in this region, even though this region around here are thin. So that results in a very limited uh, real estate of good ice in these grids. So it limits the ability of shake it off to produce consistent grids. So the kind of the next idea that John had um, is actually to maybe can, we can adjust the way we kind of plot the grid so as to be able to solve that problem. So as I reiterated earlier, the self-waking grids that had a problem here is because the uh, the nano wires present on the grids have a limited plotting capacity, which was saturated by our the mist we got from our peso um, humidifier device. So this can be solved if we can put a filter paper behind the grid now and stick it and and push it against the grid, such that when you have samples applied, the liquid can actually block through the grid because the grids are actually made of holes and get onto the filter paper itself, and the filter paper being such a large uh, kind of sponge has a limited capacity to suck the liquid. And therefore, you can apply a more sample than you can usually do and still get a thin film, and then which you can plunge and freeze. So this idea sounds pretty nice if it works, but does it really work in real life? So for normal filter paper, when you looked at um, uh, plotting it, it actually doesn't go through the grid. The, the, the liquid actually just stays as a, kind of a droplet on the grid. And only when you break the manuscripts that you that you might get liquid flowing around the side. So this actually evidently would have worked for normal filter paper. So what John discovered was that by first of all by glow discharging both sides of the grid uh, quite aggressively, and then using a different type of filter paper called a glass fiber filter paper, this could be achieved. So now you can see here for glass fiber filter paper, you can actually add liquid on the grid and actually goes right through the grid. And um, um, you can see that nothing accumulates on the grid or the water goes right through it and it gets absorbed on a glass fiber filter paper. So this is pretty exciting. And we wanted to know why that was the case. So doing a quick uh, SEM, you can see that it's because of this, probably because of the size of the fiber. So the fi filter paper fibers are quite thick, whereas the, filter the, the fibers for the glass fiber filter paper are quite thin. Um, this probably will allow for a greater uh, capacity to kind of absorb the liquid and therefore might explain the superior absorption capabilities to a glass fiber filter paper. 
So we kind of tested this um, kind of technology on a conventional vitrification device that's commercially bought the CB3, which was the third one you saw earlier. And this allow us to, um, to by adding like three microliter sample on a grid and then blotting from the back using the glass fiber filter paper, we were able to produce thin ice and uh, as you can see here from these images. So this technology can actually work with conventional devices. So what we wanted to do now is like combine this true grid wicking technology together with the shake it off device I've built to make a new device we call back it up. Because now the filter paper is now coming from the back of the, of the, uh, of the grid and then you're spraying your sample in the front of it. So this is pretty much similar to what I had before. So I like to focus your attention on, 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 the, on the arrangement of the grid as well as the filter paper. So now we have a filter paper that has been reintroduced and that is placed behind the grid while the sample is actually applied from the front using this PESO. So using this device to back it up, we are able to produce very consistent ice now. So here you can see using apophyrotin, we can get grids that have, have large good real estate, more than one third of the ice is actually usable and across multiple different grids actually. So here we show two, but from all that I've made like three or four, they have pretty similar um, ice distribution for, for the apophyrotin, which you're able to produce good 2D class averages that, put, that can give a two angstrom uh, map, which can see kind of water molecules here. So it's, um, we show here that the backup device is amiable to produce in high resolution single particle data set. It's all nice as well and we wanted to try this backup device on membrane proteins uh, containing detergent because that's what our lab works on, membrane proteins. And actually it works pretty well. So with even with detergent present in the sample which is known for conventional um, freezing that you get a kind of a steep gradient of ice, it's able to produce a kind of a good gradient of ice over here, this detergent DDM uh, for these ATP synthase proteins. So ATP synthase is a 600 kilodalton protein uh, from, and these two are from different species and I'll not elaborate on them further because my colleagues in lab are still working on them. And next one thing we wanted to try with the back it up is actually to, to try to go for speed uh, because if you can use um, the back it up and make it really, really fast, what it allows us to do, for example, is first of all, is time resolve experiments, which is great if you have some biology that, that you need to see that. But second of all, this uh, is help solve the age problem with cryo-EM in that there's deleterious air water interface interactions are present. So here in this paper by Alex Noble and the Carragher and Potter lab, they, what they show is that you, you can have a kind of a, uh, by plunging really slowly, you have multiple, a lot of the apophyrotin kind of adhere to the surface uh, of the air water interface and very few in a bulk solution. But if you plunge kind of fast enough, like 170 milliseconds, you get more proteins that present in air water interface. Uh, not in air water interface, but in a bulk solution. The idea is that the proteins actually absorb an air water interface when, uh, when they touch to it because it's such, um, it's such a harsh location and actually can denature proteins as well as cause preferred orientation. So in order to test how fast we can speed up our, our device, we actually use a hemoglobin trimer sample, which was also used in, in their paper. This sample actually uh, adopts a preferred orientation view when it sticks to the air water interface, so it's very telling. We're only when it's not an air water interface that you can see kind of side views of it. One way to kind of reduce the plunge time is that we actually shorten the distance between the grid uh, when it samples applied as well as the cryogen, so there is less distance to travel before it's plunged. Here you can see that. Okay, you only need to plunge a really short distance before it hits the cryogen, so it's as close as it, it gets. So does this work? Um, so by kind of measuring the time, we actually can see that the time between wicking as well as uh, the, the freezing is about 90 milliseconds, and actual time between the retraction, actual retraction itself, and freezing is only 60 milliseconds, so it's really short. So if we win the like 100 millisecond time range, which you see a difference, um, which uh, the previous paper, Alex Noble actually saw the difference for apoferritin as well as hemoglobin, so that's good. And we do see that difference here. So conventionally, when it flows with a CP3 with a five seconds kind of blotting time, what we see is that you have 98% of the particles adopting a top view and only about 2% of the particles having side views. 
and it's really a preferred orientation because all the particles are touching the airliner face. So with the back it up with 90 milliseconds between the wicking as well as the freezing, we can get only 66% of particles having a top view and 34% or 74 more than the, the CP3 having side views. So this is great because this kind of fits really well with also what Alex observed and also shows that we can outrun the air water interface interactions. And this allows us the abundance of side views allows us to kind of reconstruct a very isotropic 3D map of hemagglutinin to 2.9 angstroms. We can see very nice high chain density as well as the glycans. So here's a kind of a summary of, of what I talked about earlier, the kind of video format. So all I can see is that normal filter paper is not able to kind of wick the, the liquid through the grid. Uh, what you need is, first of all, to blow to discharge both sides of the grids for two minutes, as well as using a glass fiber filter paper. And that will allow for liquid to go through your, uh, your grid um, normally. This will work for any conventional grid. And the idea is that by using the back it up, you can use the paddle to spray liquids onto the grid and then the excess liquid will be whipped onto the filter paper and then now you have a thin film of liquid which can plunge. And this is kind of the full glory of the back it up device. And to actually use the device, what we do is we place the tweezers over here, the filter paper is behind it, the paddle with the sample will be in front of it and your liquid is applied to the back of the paddle. Your filter paper is now pushed against the, the grid and then after sample application, the grid can be plunged straight into the liquid ethane with a short distance to allow for high speed um, uh, time resolve experiments if required. And then afterwards, you can store your grid in your grid box and or image it in a microscope. This allow us, this device allow, allow us to have large areas of usable ice, uh, with, which gives you a two angstrom able priority reconstruction, as well as be able to reduce the time from spraying to plunging to give you um, a less preferred um, hemoglobin data set that we can reconstruct to point nine instruments. So in conclusion, this back it up device which uses true grid wicking allows us to make use of just conventional grids so we don't need any of the nano special nano wire grids anymore. It's able to produce grids with a lot of good eyes for higher resolution cryem as we see for the two angstrom apophyrotin data set. It also works for these Pergen solubilized membrane proteins, as we saw for the ATP synthase, is also able to plunge really fast to avoid error interface interactions and maybe pave the way for time resolve studies, as we saw for the hemoglobin sample. So underlying all these things is that the reason why I kind of built this homemade device is not only the, uh, to help also with modularity that you can actually add things onto it as you want to be able to control how you treat samples. At the same time, the cost is also very low. This whole thing is very cheap to build. It only costs a USD $300 to make the whole device from things you can buy off, uh, online. And the software design files for this are actually available on the GitHub for everyone to use. And actually, there are labs that have really began building their own um, back it up device from all the, using all these cheap materials. And we are looking forward to interacting with more people to well, start building their own devices as well. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also thank um, John Rubenstein, my PI in lab, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to work with, with this nice filtration device, as well as other members in the lab. I'd like to thank my um, funding sources from WinSickKids as well as CIHR. Any questions?